So uh, let's just get, get started now. So as always, uh, before we get into the session, we're gonna start with some announcements, which I'll be giving this time. So in terms of workshop logistics, it's just pretty much the same as always. We have our website where you can find the recordings and materials associated with the, all the past sessions. And after class, I'll be having office hours if anyone is able to join and is interested in getting some extra help. And then we have, if you want some uh, to stay up to date on this work, what's happening with this workshop or any other UCR US events, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, in terms of upcoming events for UCR US as a whole, we have our social night uh, this Friday. So May 7th will be at 6 p.m. and it will be on Zoom. Uh, more details will be available on our website and on social media. So if you want to come blow some steam with us, that'd be a great way to do it. And our last major event of the school year, our banquet will be Saturday, May 22nd, during which we'll be revealing the leads and board members for next year. And we'll also be giving a year in review to uh, show how far we've come. Now then, let's uh, go over the agenda for this session of our workshop series. So what we'll be doing this session is first uh, introducing the 16 by two LCD display, which is the last electronic component that we will be covering in this, week, this workshop series. And then we'll be introducing the final project for this event workshop series, which will involve a range of topics discussed throughout the previous sessions, as well as the LCD display. And well, I'll be breaking down the programming elements of the project in order to make it easier for you to start working on it. And at the end, I will be explaining the schedule for the final session of this workshop series, which is session five. So the one right after this one. So this 16 by two LCD is central to the final project. So let's uh, explain basically what it is and how to use it. So the 16 by two liquid crystal display, uh, that's what LCD stands for, is a small screen that can display a specific number of characters where each character occupies a certain position with a fixed number of pixels. So basically we, we have one main screen that is split up into sections and each section can display its own image. In this case, it would be a character. So it could be like a letter, a number, any of the special characters you can find on your keyboard and also some other things. And so the display we'll be using is separated into 32 positions, which can each display a character with up to 35 pixels. Characters are displayed by selectively allowing light from an LED called the backlight to pass through those pixels on the screen. Using this screen allows you to convey information to a user without relying on a connection to a computer, which is required to use a serial monitor. It can also be used, as we will see in the final project, to display moving objects, which cannot be easily done with the serial monitor. And that's just done by changing the position of the character over time. You can have 
motion. So the 16 by two LCD has 16 pins, which you can supply signals to in order to uh, <clears throat> control it. So first there's four power supply pins, two of which are for powering the logic circuitry inside of the LCD. The other two are for powering the backlight LED. The backlight power supply controls the brightness of the backlight and thus how visible the characters are on the screen when used in conjunction with the contrast control pin, which is the VO pin here on the uh, pinout. And the wall of the power supply for the logic will match the voltage of the Arduino which is five volts. The power supply for the backlight will usually be reduced to a lower level using a resistor. And specifically what voltage you want for the backlight depends on how much brightness you need. The, then there are three read-write control lines, which are used for basically to determine how data that is being communicated over the data lines should be uh, handled by the LCD display. And then there's the data lines themselves, which there are eight of, they're labeled DB0 through DB7. And you can either use uh, all eight data bits at once, or you can just use four of them. And the only difference there is how quickly you can communicate data. But for the rest of this workshop, we'll just be using the four bit mode. And a bit more on those read write control lines. The specifically they are register select or RS read, write, select, or RW, and enable. The register select pin is used to change whether you are sending instructions or character data to the LCD. The read, write, select pin is used to control whether you are reading data from or writing data to the registers which control what is displayed on the screen. And the enable pin is used when sending the data to tell the LCD when data is ready to be received. In case you're curious, there will be a link to the data sheet for the 16 by two LCD we will be using in the participant files for this workshop, which you can get to through our website. So all of the pins I just described to you probably sounds rather complicated and you probably wouldn't even begin to know uh, or to start with programming on an individual pin level how to control the LCD. Fortunately, we do not need to write the code which manages these pins <clears throat> because it's already available to us in the form of an Arduino library. And that library is the liquid crystal library. <clears throat> and as with any other Arduino library, the first step is to use an include statement. So pound sign, then include, and then the <clears throat> library name in angle brackets with uh, dot H at the end. And that will ensure that the library's code is compiled with your own code. After you've done that, <clears throat> you must create an object of type liquid crystal and provide the Arduino pins connected to the various IO pins on the LCD in the, uh, as the argument when you are creating this object. So, in 
the in Tinkercad, the kind of default name to use for this object is LCD all in lowercase, but you can use any, you could give it any name you wanted. And then these pins here are the pit pins that there's a there's an example circuit which we'll get to soon for you for interfacing an Arduino with an LCD on Tinkercad. And these pin numbers are the numbers you would use for that circuit. But in general, the order in which pin numbers must be given is first the RS or register select, then enable, and then pins and the data pin uh, pins you'll be using. Since we're only interested in using the four bit mode, we only have to give the uh, pins for four data bits. <clears throat> and we're also omitting the read write select pin since we only intend on writing. So that would just be grounded in the actual circuit. And any other pins that aren't given here are not going to be connected to a, any of the digital pins on the Arduino. It'll only be uh, these six pins here. So there are five functions from the Liquid Crystal library that you'll need to know for the final project. And these are the functions that you'll be using the most whenever you use the library to interact with an LCD. First is lcd.begin, which simply tells the Liquid Crystal object what the dimensions of your LCD are. In this case, it will be 16 columns and two rows. So you can call the function exactly as shown on this slide. This function call only needs to be made once, so it will generally be executed in the setup function. The next function, lcd.setCursor, allows you to set where the next character will be displayed by specifying a position on the LCD by its column and row. Rows and columns in the Liquid Crystal library are indexed like arrays in C or C++ with the first location corresponding to the index zero. So your column value can be between zero and 15, while your row value can be either zero or one. And then there's lcd.write, which actually draws a character at the cursor's position. You can choose to specify a character literal, which is just a single character in single quotation marks. Or you can also use a variable of type char, in which case it'll write whatever char is stored in that variable at the time. Let's see, are there any questions so far? All right, looks like we're good. So these are the most basic functions and really you could perform any possible operation using just these functions. However, there are two other functions in the library which make changing multiple characters at once easier by calling these simpler functions for you. The first is lcd.print which displays the characters of a string on consecutive spaces on the LCD screen, starting with the location of the cursor. So this is equivalent to repeatedly using lcd.write over all of the characters in the string. And in lcd.write, the cursor automatically moves forward. So when you call print, you're going to end up with the characters in the string lined up one after another. However, if the message you're trying to print exceeds the space available before reaching the end of a row, it will be cut off. And I'll show you what that looks like in pretty soon. Then the second function 
is lcd.clear, which replaces all the characters on the screen with blank spaces. And it's equivalent to using lcd.write with the space character on all 32 locations, basically erasing any non empty characters. So uh, conveniently, Tinkercad has a pre-built circuit for controlling the LCD that you can add to your designs. This circuit already has all the connections needed to use the liquid crystal library for controlling the LCD in four bit mode. And something to note about this circuit is there's a potentiometer included, which allows you to control the contrast of the LCD screen, basically by having two of its uh, pins be power and ground. So there's five volts total volt and voltage dropped across the potentiometer, but then the wiper pin is connected to the uh, contrast pin on the LCD. So whatever voltage you're getting from the potentiometer will be what voltage is seen by the contrast pin. So you could basically use that to tune the contrast so that you're able to see the characters clearly. I've found that having the potentiometer turned all the way to the right usually ends up giving you good contrast, but you might have to play with it more. So now I'm going to demo some of the functions I just demonstrated, or I just explained in Tinkercad. So before I do that, uh, I'll show you how to get this uh, starter circuit for the LCD display. So if you if you're in your Tinkercad workspace and you go to the side panel where it lets you pick your components, you can go to this drop down menu and under starters select Arduino. It'll give you this list of starter circuits involving Arduino boards. Close to the bottom there's one called LCD. You can just drag that in to your workspace and it'll give you the whole thing all at once. So that's how you get that. Now the first uh, function I want to demonstrate is lcd.write. And we're going to look at what happens when lcd.write is used repeatedly. In this, in this example, just using a for loop where the thing that's being executed over the loop is just lcd.write. And the code is going to increment a variable i and to print its value as a character. So i is going to be an integer but we can convert the integer into its character representation just by adding its value to the character representation of the number zero and this works because of how the characters representing the single digit numbers are encoded in the ascii representation for text now because we can only display single digit numbers and the loop could take i's value up as far as 15. We mod the value of i by 10. So once i become is uh, in the double digits, it'll will just be taking the ones digit and converting 
that to its character representation. And you can see in the loop, I never actually changed the position of the cursor, but when I run the simulation, you'll see that the characters are not printed all one on top of each other, rather they get spread out like this. So you can see each channel on value of I increased, it moved to the next space in this top row. And when the cursor goes past the last position on the top row, it can't continue to write characters. So that's why I have the loop stop when I equals 16. Now let's take a look at lcd.print. The code I have here is actually going to be writing out a message word by word so that only one word will be displayed on the screen at any one time. Each time we print the next word, we're going to clear the screen, get rid of the previous word, and then reset the cursor to 0, 0 because the cursor will have moved to one position past the end of the last string that was printed. So let's run the simulation. And you can see here, each individual letter is small, or each individual word is small enough to easily fit on the top row of the LCD. However, if we were to try to print the full message at once, clearly it would not all fit because it's more than 16 characters long. So I actually have code that will attempt to print a similarly long message all at once. Let's see what happens when we try to do that. So you see the first three met words were displayed, but after that it got got cut off. And so you really need to be aware of the limits of how many characters you can display at one time. You can, if you need to display messages longer than 16 characters, you can give yourself more room by using the bottom row. And I'll demonstrate that now. So since we got cut off after the space, I'll start a new, uh, let me stop the simulation. I'll start a new line. Start a new string here. And before we print the as a string, we have to use set cursor. Set onto the bottom row and still on the zero column. You know, this should give the message divided between both rows. Okay, now you can see it still gets cut off uh, and gets cut off in the middle of this last word because our message is actually more than 32 characters long. That means you can't possibly display it all on the LCD at once. So you may need to find ways to break up your message like we did in the previous demo where we displayed it one word at a time. That's just something to consider when you're using the LCD display in, in future projects. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the LCD display.
Are there any questions before we move on to the final project? Going once, going twice. All right, so now that you've seen what the LCD is capable of, it's time to see how it can be used in the final project. This project is built around making a simple arcade style game that can be played on an Arduino circuit. The game is called an endless runner because it follows the genre of games where the player is running down an endless track and dodging obstacles to see how long they can last. In our game, the track is going to be the two rows of the LCD, and the player will dodge obstacles by moving between these rows. The player will switch rows when a button is pressed, and this is the only form of control that is needed since the obstacles will be doing most of the movement. This is similar to a lot of endless runner games where the player is actually fixed in place along one dimension. And it's actually the track that's and the obstacles that's moving towards them. So to get you started on this project, you'll be using a pre-made circuit on Tinkercad, which is the one I was using for the demos, as well as a template code file, which will be available in the GitHub repository for this workshop series. Uh, and I'll show you where you can find this template code. So this is what the base directory of the repository looks like. There should be a link to this repository in the student materials or yeah. And then you want to go to session four and then the folder marked final project. And then this gives you a very brief rundown of the project. And then in the final project template uh, uh, folder, you find the code for an Arduino sketch. That is uh, the template. And the sketch is going to look like this. So there's a lot of comments and stuff provided for you to help you help you get started and clarify anything that is what could be confusing. And then there are these functions here that are mostly empty. In fact, uh, move obstacles is the only one where there's a little bit of starter code for you. Otherwise, they're completely empty. And then all you need to do is write the code in each of these functions that will implement them to have the desired behavior. So basically, that's uh, the overview. And hold on. Uh, before I get into the programming and the game mechanics, I'll show you what the final project looks like in action, both in Tinkercad and on a physical circuit. So you can have some idea of where the project is headed. First, I'll show it on Tinkercad. So you can see the only uh, modification that really needs to be made to the starter circuit is the uh, introduction of this button, which is how the player character is controlled. We run this simulation. You can see this is the player character in the corner here. And then 
the obstacles of the things moving towards it. And then if I press this button, I can dodge the obstacles by switching the row I'm in. And of course, if you are, you've already seen several times, if an obstacle hits you head on, then it's going to be game over and the game starts over again. And there's a bit more to it to that, like the serial, how the serial monitor is incorporated into the project, which I'll get to later on. But for the most part, that's uh, how the final project is going to work once it's been fully coded. And I'm going to stop sharing for a second in order to show you the project in action on a physical circuit. So if you so you can just pay attention to my cam for a second. Just give me a second to get this set up. Okay. So hopefully you can see it. I know the lighting is is going to be really bad. But hopefully you can see the circuit, uh, see the LCD and what's going on. Just trying to position it all right. So there's a push button right here. And that corresponds to the button which controls the player. So I can play this game just like I was in Tinkercad. So it works perfectly well in hardware. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a second to put this away. All right. So because we'll be using the uh, so in the most basic version of this game, there are two objects, and I'll be calling them entities, which show up on the screen. Those are the player and the obstacles. You've already seen how the be they behave pretty much. The player is confined to one column but can swap between rows, and the obstacles enter the screen on the side opposite to the player and move towards the player at a constant speed. And they're actually confined to the row they start in. And the game ends once the player collides with an obstacle. And in other words, they occupy the same space. Because we're using the 16 by 2 LCD to display all this information to the, the person playing the game, both the player character and the obstacles will need to be represented as characters. In, the in this game we'll be making, you've got the two objects of interest and we choose, or at least I've chosen to represent the player character using an at symbol and then they'll represent the obstacles using brackets. Now, what, how we uh, represent the entities internally is using this struct. So basically we're, we want to provide a high level of flexibility. So we can, we generalize the types of things that can appear on the screen. 
into entity objects, which are defined by these three properties, row, column, and image. As you might imagine, row and column indicate the position on the LCD, which actually corresponds to a position in an array in, well, for the obstacles, it also corresponds to a position in an array in memory for the player. It's just for indicating position on the LCD. And then there's the image, which is just dictating how the entity will appear on the LCD. So all, all three of these fields will need to be managed for each entity you create. Uh, and basically by defining an entity this way, we can store all the relevant information about a single entity together in memory and easily create new entities. The memory manipulation used to interact with these entities is kept within a set of helper functions that will be provided for you. Since the, if you're just learning C or C++, then I won't really expect you to understand concepts like pointers and dynamic memory allocation yet. If you're interested, you can look through the code for the helper and ask me any questions you have. Now, the player movement occurs when a button is pressed and it should only happen when the button is pushed down. So releasing the button should not move the player. You can use a, a state machine to track whether the button is being pressed, held, or released. Uh, that's actually, the template is kind of set up to help you do that. Moving the player on the LCD screen requires two steps. First, you have to clear the position on the screen where the player was, and then you have to draw the player in character in its new position. Note that an individual space on the screen can be cleared by writing the space character on that location. And by the way, the state machine for the button is effect essentially the same as the button state machine that Sahas briefly explained in session one where there's only two states and you switch between the states based on the reading from the book from the button pin. We will be checking the state machine on each run through the game loop in order to make it as responsive as possible. Now, that's pretty much all you need to know about the player actually. So let's talk about the obstacles. Which uh, it's more complicated than because of how you need you need to coordinate the movement of them and creating new obstacles so that there's constantly op obstacles for the player to deal with and avoid. Let's first get, uh, talk about how we keep track of the obstacles that already exist. So each position on the LCD is a position that can contain an obstacle. And we want these positions to be able to contain any type of entity uh, in case we want to add more later. So we create two arrays of length 16 to represent the positions. And we allow each array index to be associated with an entity. This association is done using pointers and that requires dynamic allocation and memory management but the helper functions will handle all of that for you. So you'll just be focused on moving the entities to the desired location. And uh, the picture on this slide shows how the index of the array corresponds to the position on the LCD. Numbers on top are the column numbers and numbers on the left on the left are the row numbers. It should be pretty self-explanatory because the way that the positions are indexed in the liquid crystal library is going to match the indexes for 
uh, the arrays. So we'll basically be using the same values regardless of whether you're, you're dealing with the arrays in memory or the display itself. So when we're spawning an entity, the row which it starts on should be determined randomly. So that way it's not too predictable. You can use the random function, which functions as a random number generator to achieve this. Before the random function can be used, a value used internally called a seed must be set using the function random seed which you would pass the seed value into that function as the parameter. Now this determines the sequence of numbers that will be returned from subsequent calls to the random function. And when you're calling the random function, once the seed has been set, you will need to pass in the upper bound, which is a required argument and the lower bound, which is an optional argument since it defaults to zero. And then the random function will return a number that is uh, less than the maximum or upper bound and greater than or equal to the minimum or lower bound. Basically, it's it's making, it makes sure that the number you get will be within those bounds by using arithmetic to manipulate the raw value that was obtained from the uh, internal random number generator. And since we're, we'll be needing a random row, that's either a zero or one, and in order to get either a zero or a one, we can use the default lower bound of zero and our upper bound needs to be two so that the largest value we can get is one. Now the random number generator that the random function uses is considered pseudo random because it actually pulls numbers from a predefined sequence. The sequence itself is very long but after enough calls to random, it would end up looping back to the point in the sequence where it started. And the seed that you pass into a random seed function sets which point in the sequence that the random number generator will begin taking numbers from next. So for now, we will simply use the same initial seed each time the program begins by including random seed with the number zero as its argument in our setup function. So that means that, that every time we uh, start up the program, we're going, the random number generator is going to start selecting numbers from the same location in the sequence. And that's all right for our purposes because the game we're making is going to automatically restart. So the setup fun uh, function is only going to be called once. And so the fixed number seed will only be for the first game that is played. So for the sake of simplicity, we can just use that. If you need the seed at the very start of the program to be different each time, you would need to have a value that is not easily predictable from the very beginning of the program. An example of a value you, you could use or source for these values would be a noisy voltage reading from an unconnected analog pin on the Arduino board. Now, to prevent the games that are played after the first round from being too predictable, the random seed is changed before we're starting the next game. This time, we already have a somewhat random value to use, and that is the length of time that the previous game lasted. 
Now, moving on from obstacle spawning, let's talk about how we move the obstacles. The obstacles are going to move towards the player in order to present a threat and force the player to move. And the main criteria for the obstacle movement is that they move in one direction, which is towards the player, and there's no overlap in the obstacles. So basically, you won't have one obstacle moving into a position occupied by another one. On an individual level, each obstacle simply moves from its current column to the column on its left. And since all obstacles are moving to the left, the leftmost obstacle cannot possibly collide with another obstacle. So furthermore, since all obstacles move the same distance, once the leftmost obstacle is moved, there cannot be any obstacle blocking the next closest obstacle to the left side. So what we would want to do is start by moving that leftmost obstacle and then move the next leftmost obstacle and on and on down the line until they've all been moved. And then you do, once, that, once that's been done for run one row, you just repeat it for the other row. And all this happens very, very quickly. So uh, from the perspective of the player, it looks like all the obstacles moved simultaneously. Now there are three helper functions that are provided to abstract away the memory management, like I mentioned before. And let's go over all three of them. First is set obstacle position, which is used when moving obstacles. It allows for flexibility in how the obstacles move, but for now you should always be moving them one space to the left. The next is add obstacle, which is used when creating new obstacles. It also offers flexibility in where which space those obstacles are added in. You should always be adding them to the furthest right column, and that would be the one indexed by the number 15. Finally, there's the clear obstacle arrays function, which is called once each time the game is reset. There are comments on the template file which give more info about usage and other considerations for these helper functions. And furthermore, the code for each of these helper, helper functions is already written for you at the end of the template. And you shouldn't be worried about trying to understand it as long as you understand how to use the functions themselves to achieve the desired behavior. Let's uh, look more closely at the set obstacle position function. So I've given the full uh, declaration of the function here so you can see the arguments that it takes. First is first to our old row and old column, which is the coordinates for the uh, obstacle that you're trying to move. And then there's new row and new column, which are the coordinates of the position you're moving it to. It's important to note that there should be an entity at the position with co the coordinates given by old row and old column uh, before calling the function, or else the function will do nothing because it didn't have anything to move. There also should not be an entity at the position with coordinates new row and new column or else it will be overwritten when the function is called. So, I mean, technically, if you, you could uh, call, no, just call set obstacle position on a position without knowing whether or not it has an obstacle, like here, if you're okay with the, uh, having these extra fun function calls that don't do anything, you could do that because it's not gonna mess anything up. 
if there's no uh, obstacle available to be moved, the function will just return without doing anything. So as an example, let's say that zero five is your current position. So that's row zero, column five. And you wanna move one space to the left. Your function call would look like this. So the first two arguments, of course, is zero and five. The next two arguments are zero and four because four is what the position a uh, column to the left of five. And you don't necessarily need to use literal integer values like zero or five or four as the arguments here. So for example, when you're looping across uh, one, of, one of the arrays, which is pretty much the easiest way to uh, implement the move obstacles function. You will likely be referencing the positions of obstacles using variables, as in you would have you would be using I to indicate column numbers. So if the obstacle was in row zero and I is the column of the obstacle before it is moved, then for the the coordinates for the new position would be the same row, but I minus one for the column. And don't forget to check for a collision with the player when you're moving your an obstacle onto column zero. The way you would do that is comparing it with player dot row, which I actually haven't mentioned yet, but the way you you access the uh, elements in the entity struct is using this dot operator. So you put the name of the struct object itself on the left side and the name of the uh, member of that struct you're trying to access on the right side. So if you compare the uh, uh, row of the obstacle you're moving to the player row and you find, or wait, no, the, that's uh, actually the comparison is not being done inside of the if uh, statement logic. And actually, we're calling this if statement as if we already know that the row of the obstacle is one. So we just need to know that the obstacle is in column zero and the player is in row one. Then we would know that there's an overlap between the obstacle and the player. And then we would trick our game over. So the obstacle is in row one and the column is stored in I. And one other thing is the set obstacle position function is auto programmed to automatically delete an obstacle and it's trying to set its position to a location outside of the arrays in memory. So you don't need to check for that yourself. So spawning obstacles is simple with the add obstacle function. You just specify which row and column you want the obstacle, obstacle to be created at. And from there, once it's been created, the next time you move all the obstacles, you should be able to access that obstacle and move it along with all the other existing ones. Note that this function returns true or false depending on whether the space was unoccupied, which means you can check if the operation was successful and try the other row if not. 
depending on how you uh, implement the game loop, if you order it so that the obstacle movement comes before the obstacle spawning, then theoretically you shouldn't have to worry about the uh, column 15 having any obstacles on it when you're spawning, but uh, it still gives you this option to check that. So these obstacles need to move and spawn on a set interval. And that will naturally limit the amount of obstacles on screen at any given time, assuming that two obstacles cannot apply the same, cannot occupy the same location. However, we may want to control that number further to make the game less difficult. For example, you, you saw in uh, when I was demoing the project, there was only three obstacles on the screen at once. The way we do that, or at least one easy way to do that is to change the time interval between obstacles being added. So uh, we have the define preprocessor directive, which was met uh, mentioned in a previous session. And it's used to create an, an alias for the value in milliseconds of the time interval. And then that value can be changed for the entire program simply by changing one number. And we apply uh, that to uh, any parameter we, want, parameter we want to make easily changeable. And in order to actually implement this delay, we need to keep track of the time elapsed since the last obstacle was added and avoid running that code again until enough time has passed. So, uh, in order to, okay, sorry, I got a little messed up there. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is uh, we're going, for these timers, we're going to create an integer variable and set it to zero initially. And then within the loop function, we'll add a delay so that each time that the time elapsed during a single execution of the function is approximately one millisecond. Since the execution of the actual code is assumed to take much less than a millisecond, the delay itself needs to, will need to last a full millisecond and time spent executing the code will be negligible. This way, if we increase the variable each time we execute the loop function, it will count the number of milliseconds elapsed. We can use an if statement to check whether the number of milliseconds elapsed is equal to a certain value, and if so, we execute the function that we wanted to use in that interval and then reset the variable to zero. So what we covered so far explains how the functions move player, move obstacles, and spawn obstacle will be implemented. Now we will discuss the other four functions, which are game setup, game over, setup, and loop. These are the higher level functions that will perform all of the steps to set up each game, orchestrate the creation and movement of both types of entities, and keep track of things like player score. First, we have the initial setup procedure that is called only once at the very beginning, and hence we put it in the setup function. So we'll need to first initialize the serial port, button pin, and the LCD display. Then you need to set the seed for the random number generator using just the constant number. Then you set the player location to the coordinate zero, zero, and set their image using the game parameter defined at the top of the file. Then you can 
Uh, initialize the counters game time and number of games to zero. Since this is the very beginning and no games have been played yet. Finally, you call game setup to complete the setup for a new game. Now, speaking of the game setup function, this is going to be called every time you need to restart the game. What you'll do is increment the count for the number of games and reset the player row to zero. The, you don't have to change, uh, change the column since that should have remained at zero. We'll then add the player character to the screen initially, because otherwise it won't up until the button has been pressed at least once. Then you'll use clear obstacle arrays, the helper function, to erase any existing obstacles. We'll use the variable game time to set the ra random seed for the new game base. And so the random seed will be based on how long the previous game lasted. And then you will reset the counters movement timer, spawn timer, cur obstacles, and game time. Next, we have the game over procedure. So the first thing I want to do is display a game over message on the LCD. I want to leave it up there for around one second, then remove the message. Then on the serial monitor, you'll output how many games have been played and the score for the past game, where we'll define the score as the number of full seconds for which the players survive. Finally, we'll call the game setup function to restart. Now, finally, we have the code that runs continuously when the game is running. This belongs in the loop function, which will cause it to be run repeatedly for you. So first call the move player function to check if the player needs to be moved. Then you will, if the movement timer which is for the obstacles has reached the value of the parameter move underscore delay. You will move all obstacles and reset the movement timer. If spawn timer has reached the value of the parameter spawn underscore delay. You will spawn an obstacle and reset the spawn timer. And the corresponding functions to call for these two are move obstacles and spawn up and, and add obstacle or I think it was spawn obstacle, add obstacles helper function, yeah. Then to keep things moving along, you delay by one millisecond. And finally, you increment movement timer, spawn timer, and game time because they're counting the number of milliseconds elapsed. Okay, and that finishes up the discussion about the final project. Uh, I just want to make a quick final announcement about the agenda for next session. So next week will be the final session in this workshop series. We'll start with a wrap up of the final project, going over any problems or confusion people had. And we'll finish with the demonstration of how to use the same serial interface that we've been working with so far to make an Arduino board communicate with a program running on a computer. We're using Simulink as an example. As a case study, we'll look at how to implement a data logger that can take advantage of Simulink's tools for data manipulation and analysis. So I'll be looking forward to that. That's all for session four. Thanks for coming.